my channel. I'm Nurse Dre and you're watching some true crime today. If you would like to see more true crime and more homeopathic remedies and stuff for the future to take care of your stuff, go ahead and please hit that subscribe button down below and make sure you share this with a friend. Today we're talking about Elizabeth Nesbitt. <laughs> and model from the 1900s who would end up in the middle of the crime of the century. Let's get started. Y'all, it is 70 degrees in Georgia today. Like, it's the middle of December. So if you hear a fan in the background, I'm sorry. I am burning the hell up. That's what it is. This is Elizabeth Nesbitt. She was born in 1886. Yes, 1886. However, they would later on doctor her birth certificate to say 1884, so the age is kind of like a, hmm, I don't know, because they wanted her to work, so like they doctored her age. So we really don't know what year she was born, obviously, but around this time, she uh, was born to an alcoholic father, um, a mother who was a dressmaker. They were kind of like low middle class to poor, but when she was 11, her father would pass away, and this would leave them in serious, dire need for financial support from help with from family and friends, they had actually had to sell their house and all of their belongings just to be able to eat and, and then live off of family and friends. And finally, in um, the mid-1890s, they would move to Philadelphia for work. Now, in Philadelphia, they found work. It was her, her mother, Mrs. Nesbitt, and her brother, Howard. And they all found work at a department store. This was called Wanamaker's Department Store. Apparently, it was pre- um, common back then, you know, it sold everything and um, so a lot of different kind of cultures of people would come into the store to buy things and one day an artist stopped in the store and took note of Elizabeth and saw how poised she was, how mature she acted for her age and just how stunning and beautiful her face was. She had a slender body, everything that an artist would need at that time to make a beautiful portrait and so she offers to pay Elizabeth to sit for her as she paints a portrait of her. Now, back then, she would sit for three hours for someone to paint a portrait for her for just a dollar in the beginning. But that was more than what they were making at Wanamaker's. And so this began her, I guess her career jumpstart into modeling because the artist loved working with her so much that she started referring her to all of her other artist friends, other people, magazine editors, and this, things of the such. And Elizabeth grew very popular among all the artists around town and everyone loved her. Everyone loved to work with her. She was great to work with, easygoing, would sit there, sit still for hours on end. And before leaving Philadelphia, she ended up getting paid about five to ten dollars per portrait which in today's money would be like 30 bucks so it's still not great money but she's making more money than all of like the three of the family combined was making at Wanamaker's so she was basically already early into her career taking care of her entire family and feeding them. So November 1900 the family packed up and all moved to Manhattan, New York where Elizabeth would, through the referrals of her, her artist friends back home in Philly, she would find a lot of work. Now, she met a man who would kind of act as her manager. His name was James Beckworth, and he kind of like took Elizabeth under his wing. He was very protective of her, but, a, but was a very sweet man. And he got her the best jobs in town, and it wasn't long before she was booking job after job after job because people noticed that whatever they put Elizabeth's face on, things would sell. So they put her on the front of a magazine, the magazines would all sell because she was gorgeous. If they put her in a perfume ad, all of the perfume would sell. I mean, literally everybody who was selling something wanted to work with Elizabeth and she was making awesome money. I mean, even Coca-Cola was trying to work with her. So she was pretty popular. She would even pose in some risque portraits and kind of like coined the phrase pinup girl. I mean, she literally was the first pinup girl and men loved it. At this point, Evelyn was making triple what all three of them had been making at Wanamaker's before. And so her mother really wasn't working, which it was hard for her mom to find work anyways, because it was like, you know, if you were in New York, 
and you're a seamstress or a dressmaker, the competition was crazy. So her mom couldn't find much work. They got Elizabeth good though. But all this money rolling in really wasn't enough for Elizabeth. Elizabeth had come from such a poor background that she really wanted to be financially independent. And she thought that the best way to do this was to enter the showbiz industry, get work in a play or a, you know, on Broadway or something, and maybe somehow meet a man through that way. Because a lot of women or showgirls at the time who went on to Broadway would go on to meet very financially set popular rich businessmen and marry them. The businessmen wanted a pretty piece of arm candy and the girls wanted to be financially stable. So Elizabeth heard about this and she was like, maybe if I don't, you know, make enough money myself, maybe I'll find a husband. So she enters the showbiz industry and she lands her first act as a showgirl, as a chorus girl in a play. This play happened to be the very famous Broadway production called Floridora and this would open a lot of doors for her. It led on to her next role being the main role as Vashti in the Broadway play The Wild Rose. It was during this Broadway production of The Wild Rose that she would go on to meet a man named Sanford White. Now, Stanford White was a very rich architect and very well known around New York. He was the man that designed Madison Square Gardens, which is a like staple point in New York and a very very famous place to go even to today. So he was well known, he was very rich, he was wanted by everybody to, you know, either build their building or even so much as to like decorate their houses or their mansions or whatever. He was very well known. He was also well known for being a playboy. Stanford White loved the ladies and loved the virgins, <laughs> okay, because his favorite thing to do was to deflower a lady or to take her most innocent precious gift <laughs> that we would say. I don't know, like, come on. It's a big deal when it's really not. Okay, ladies, it's not a big deal. You lose your virginity, you move on. Whatever. But back then, you guys know how it was. It was a totally different time. You did not lose your virginity until you got married. And this would come into play a little bit later in the story. But all the women wanted to be with Stanford, or as his friends called him, Stanny. They wanted to be with Stanny because he had so much money and he was a little bit older. So I, I think he was about 47 when he met Elizabeth. And she was only 14 to 16. And... I think the reason that women wanted to be with him wasn't just because he was rich. I think it was because he <laughs> he was getting up there in age and women who are gold diggers think about these kinds of things. They get with older men because they know they're going to die soon and they're going to get inher they're going to inherit all that money, right? Like I think that was one of the things too. But nonetheless, she meets this guy Stanny and Stanny falls head over heels for Elizabeth. I mean, completely. Now, she won't sleep with him, but they do date and he starts showering her with gifts and money and expensive things and lavish dinners and these things. And one day he invites Elizabeth over for lunch and, and her best friend. So her best friend and Elizabeth going over to Stanny's for lunch and he lives in a multi-level beautiful apartment mansion in New York. And Elizabeth and her friend are like bewildered by this. They're bewildered by all of this. I mean like because they come from very poor families. I mean Elizabeth lives with two other people in a one bedroom apartment above a shack. Like literally she's coming from the worst to the top. Everything is decorated to the tee with the most expensive furniture, the most expensive art. They're served a lavish, beautiful meal with a glass of champagne. And then they're given a tiny little tour to some of the rooms in the apartment. And they come to this one room after lunch and Stanny brings her in there. And it's a beautiful room decked in greenery. And in the very corner, there is a beautiful red velvet swing that is hanging from some vines. Elizabeth is enamored by the swing. She loves it. She thought it was the most lavish, like, beautiful thing that you could have in an apartment. It was kind of like, it, I guess it was kind of like surprising to her that somebody would have something like a swing inside their apartment. You know what I mean? Now, it's said that the rest of the afternoon they hung out in this room and Elizabeth had the time of her life. Now, we don't know what kind of fun she was having, but they say that she was just having normal fun. 
So Elizabeth goes home and she is freaking out. She's telling her mom and her brother about this guy that she's met and he's like totally rich. She's head over heels for him, but she wants to make him like chase her a little bit more because she knows what kind of guy Stanny is. He's got the reputation of a man who just wants to sleep with these beautiful showgirls and that's not what she wants. Elizabeth wants to be married, right? She wants to be financially set. She wants her family to be taken care of. She doesn't want to have to work and sit any, any more of these hours on end for these portraits, for these artists, right? So I guess she plays a little bit of hard to get. Now, somewhere along the way, Stanny is so desperate to have her and falls for all this hard to get mess, just nonsense, that he begins paying for crazy stuff. Like he literally moves her and her entire family into a beautiful hotel called the Wellington Hotel, which is a very famous hotel in New York. It's very lavish. Only the rich of the rich go there to even stay or eat, or even live there. To, is like you're even more rich, you know. Like your social status is very high up there if you live here. And not only that, he starts to pay for her brother Howard to go to a famous military academy, which is not cheap. So like in the beginning, Elizabeth's mom was very reluctant of this guy because she knew of his reputation. But finally, she starts coming around. I mean, I guess if a, if the guy buys you a freaking you know, beautiful apartment in the most famous rich hotel in New York and decorates it to the T like his mansion is, then I guess you would start saying, okay, maybe you can date him. You know, maybe my daughter should date him. I don't know. I guess that's what she, nobody knows what she thought. That's my opinion. Allegedly. Okay. So one day, Elizabeth's mother decides to go on vacay, right? She's going back home to visit the girls. While she's gone, she leaves Elizabeth in the very safe hands of Stanny. Now, our friend Stanny promises Mrs. Nesbitt that he is going to take care of her daughter and no harm will come to her. And so she believes it and she leaves. Well, he sure does take care of her. <laughs> Not even a few days later, Stanny invites Elizabeth over for dinner. Why am I calling her Elizabeth? Oh my God. Y'all, her name is not Elizabeth, it is Evelyn. <laughs> I don't know how long I've been calling her Elizabeth, but her name is Evelyn Nesbitt. I am so sorry, y'all. Y'all are probably like, who the fuck is she talking about? Evelyn. Evelyn! Y'all know I can't do names. Like, I am the world's worst with the names. So, Stanny calls up Evelyn, and he's like, you want to come to dinner? And she's like, yeah. And she's like, oh my god, guys, I'm going to dinner with Stanny. Like, I've been to lunch with him and not dinner yet, so yay! Whatever. <laughs> anyway, you get it. So, she dresses up very nice. She goes to dinner at Stanny's house, and they have a nice, lovely, lavish dinner like they had at lunch before. But, this time, instead of having one glass of champagne, Evelyn decides to have several glasses of champagne. And this would end up being a very bad decision and would, I guess, throw her entire life into a tumble of like unfortunate events because she starts to get a little wobbly and Stanny starts to take notice of this, right? So Stanny's like, I'm going to give her a tour of my apartment. She didn't see all my rooms last time, so let's do this. So he gives her a whole tour of the apartment. Now, at the end of the tour, they come to a beautiful room decked in like beautiful furniture, you know, like gold installations all over the room, like candelabras and things like this. The biggest deal about this room, y'all, is it is from literally wall to wall mirrors. Mirrors! There's not a place on the wall that does not have a mirror. Not to mention the ceiling is also a mirror. This place is, I think it'd be creepy for me to go in a place like this, but Evelyn was so fucking drunk that she was enamored by it all. She thought it was great. Well, she starts to get a little woozy and tired and she passes out. Now, Evelyn would later say that the next thing that she remembered was waking up in the bed next to Sanford naked. So I guess we can all assume what had occurred overnight. Stanny had taken her virginity without her even knowing. If she was um, aware of it, she definitely did not remember it. And she definitely did not consent to it. And remember, she's like between 14 and 16 years old, and this guy's like 47 years old. Can you imagine? Ugh, gross. She would later say in an interview, quote, I went in that room a virgin, but did not come out one, end quote. That is so sad. Like, what a way to lose your virginity. You know, like, 
Oh, God. Now, this would ensue a very um, weird power dynamic kind of relationship between the two forever, basically, for the rest of their lives. Because at this point, Stanny believes that she belongs to him now because he deflowered her and even says this to her after she wakes up and realizes what has happened. You know, that she belongs to him. Now, in the future, it's like... It's like Stanny wouldn't really settle down with Evelyn. She did want to settle down and marry someone. And not that she didn't want to sleep with him to begin with, but the fact was he had sexually assaulted her basically without her consent. I mean, this was, this is a bad dude, okay? And how many other girls had he done this to? But she really wanted that financial freedom. And like I said, Stanny was like 47 years old. I mean, he's getting up there in age. Back then, they didn't live till they were 80, 90 years old. So I'm sure she thought about all this. She really wanted to settle down, but he wasn't that kind of guy. But every guy that she would fall in love with or try to date, Stanny would get insanely jealous and run them off. So it was like... She couldn't have him, but she couldn't have anyone else either. And she was in this power dynamic struggle where, that she couldn't get out of, apparently. I mean, I guess he had some kind of hold on her because of what had happened. I don't know. But herein lies the problem. And remember, at this time, she is still a showgirl, basically, on Broadway. And she's doing plays all the time, you know, trying to keep her family going, keep them fed, all of this stuff, keep up her status in society. Very well known, still very popular. A lot of the guys would come and watch her show time and time again. And among these guys was a very special man. Very special indeed. Enter Harry Thaw. Let's talk about Harry Thaw for just a brief minute, okay? <laughs> He's a weird one, that Harry. He was born in 1871 in Pennsylvania to a coal and railroad tycoon named William Thaw. William Thaw was very high society, very rich, like had a $40 million fortune, which who knows how much money that is in these days. Like in the late 1800s to 2020, that's probably $200 million, like kind of fortune deal, right? That's a lot of effing money. This Harry character, he would show signs from a very young age of having very disturbing mental issues. When I say that, I mean like um, signs of schizophrenia, mania, bipolar, depression, anxiety, paranoia. Ooh, he had it all, honey. He had all of it. And no one knew what to do with children back then who had mental issues. Oh, hell, no one knew what to do with adults back then who had mental issues, let alone children. And so he definitely didn't get the help that he needed ever. And unfortunately, he runs into our little friend Evelyn. And, well, he falls for her hard. Now, he was also known as a playboy. I mean, he had issues, like, coming up. Now, as Harry got older, um, like as an older teenager and young adult, he was seen like going to cockfights, poker events, gambling, anything that he could do to spend his father's fortune. Like, he would literally light a cigar with a $100 bill, but then at the same time, the dude chased down a cab driver with a shotgun at one point because he thought he was cheated out of 10 cents. Like, the guy was fucking mental, okay? Mental. And he was also on drugs. He was using morphine on and off throughout his entire life. And if you know anything about mental illness, you know the one cardinal rule is do not do drugs. Guys, don't do drugs, period. But if you have any kind of mental issues, especially depression and anxiety, dude, don't do drugs. It just makes it ten times worse. Especially opiates, like morphine or whatever. Because you're always chasing that high and that you never get it. It's kind of one of those drugs that it's like, why even do it? I don't know. Anyway, he had no reason to be taking morphine. He was just a drug addict and just a loon. So by the time he meets Evelyn, <laughs> the state of his mental status is so deteriorated, he doesn't know what to do with himself. He literally goes to watch her show 40 times in the course of one year. Dude, he's obsessed. So finally, he gets up the courage to go and meet our little friend Evelyn, right? Yay! So he goes to meet Evelyn, and Evelyn's kind of taken aback. Like, you know, here's another guy who has a fortune coming to him, coming to her if she marries him. And she's like, okay, this could be another dude, you know, that I could date maybe to get some financial stability. And y'all, I'm not saying that she was a gold digger by any means. I'm just saying that at that time in history, if you were a woman, it was hard to work, okay? And she knew her, her years were running out. Like, she didn't have forever. She couldn't be a showgirl forever because once you age out of that stuff, you can't do it, you know? 
So women felt like they had to marry into success to be able to be successful and have an actual place in society that they could call their own and they could, you know, be rich or whatever, financially stable or whatever. So just a side note there, just to put that out there. Anyway, back to the story. So Harry starts to shower Evelyn with all of this attention, these expensive, lavish gifts and money and all, all that, you know, that he thinks is going to win her. Um... And when Stanford White found out about Harry, he flipped his marbles, man, because he knew about Harry. Harry was new to town, and Harry was trying to get into every prestigious club that he could by his way in so that he could, you know, kind of put his foot in the door to get, you know, a leg up in society in New York. Because even though he was known in Pennsylvania as, like, this high-class kind of dude that everybody knew, he wasn't well known in New York and wanted to be. A lot of people with that, this kind of mental issue and drug use, sometimes narcissism goes along with it and they want to be known and well known. You know, they think they're the shit, whatever. Anyway, so Stanford is pissed off at this guy for showering all of his gifts and affection towards Evelyn, you know, Stanford's little flower, and he doesn't like it. So he blocks all of his admissions to all of these prestigious men's club in New York so that he can't get into this society. And he'll want to run away, right? He wants to try to run him off. Just like he's done with every other one of Evelyn's boyfriends. Well, this doesn't work for Harry. All it does for Harry is piss him off. Like, he's in town and he's staying and he wants Evelyn. That's it. He ain't going nowhere over the, the means of some playboy, okay? He don't care about this playboy architect. Wanting him or not wanting him in Evelyn, Evelyn's life, it's not going to run him off. So, he pursues Evelyn. He proposes to her a million times. She says no. Now, the reason that she says no each time ended up being because... She knew that one of Harry's main things was, like, he he deathly believed in, like, if you got married, you married a virgin. You stay a virgin until you get married. As long as you're a woman. You know, like, he could go fuck anybody he wanted to. But the woman that he married, his bride, oh, oh no. She had to be a virgin. And he was going to find it. And he thought he found it in Evelyn. Little did he know she had been deflowered by the great Stanford White and the very man that he hated. So Evelyn knows this about Harry. She doesn't want to tell him just quite yet that she does not have her virginity anymore, okay? Why is this such a big deal? I swear to God. Anyway, Evelyn comes down like with like the worst case of appendicitis. She has to have an appendectomy, which is where you have your appendix taken out. So she's in the hospital recovering after her surgery. And Harry Thaw is like, shit y'all, this is a great, chance for me to go and get my foot in the door with Evelyn and show her my good side. Kind of butter her roll, right? So he comes every single day, y'all. He is like checking on her, talking to the doctors, talking to Mrs. Nesbitt about her condition, bringing her flowers, bringing her chocolates, gifts, anything that she needs while she's in the hospital. And Evelyn eats this shit up, okay? And finally, Harry's like, you know what? You know what you need? You need a vacation. You need a vacation with me. Let's go on a road trip through Europe. Let's just go visit all the sites and see what there is to see. Have you ever been to Europe, Evelyn? No. Let's go to Europe. So he talks Evelyn and Mrs. Nesbitt, her mother, into going to Europe. Now he says this is going to be like a rejuvenating thing. She's going to be fine. Well, it's anything but that because when they go on this trip, all hell breaks loose. He literally begins starting fights between Mrs. Nesbitt and Evelyn, trying to drive a wedge between them, which he eventually does. It's just hectic. Like, the way that he travels is totally manic. Like, he's from one place to the next, day to day. He is not letting Evelyn rest at all. He's not letting her recuperate from her surgery, which is really what she should be doing. And basically, she gets to this point of like frailty because she is just not recovering very well because she's in a different city every day walking miles every day to see sights and not only that she's fighting with her mother at this point and her mom is fed up with it she's like done with this vacation already but Harry ends up still even though the trip's going badly still proposes to her several times on the trip and Evelyn's like dude I cannot say yes to this guy until he knows 
that I don't have my virginity. Like he needs to know before we get married. I can't just leave him on, right? So finally, Evelyn breaks down and tells Harry the story. She tells him everything, her whole side of the story, like how she had gone to Stanny's for dinner and Stanny, you know, was being very nice to her feeding her glass after glass of champagne and she passed out in this room and she the next thing she remembers is waking up with her clothes off and she finally tells she tells Harry this you know and he's pissed off already like oh my god because the one man that he hates the most in the world is the one who took his bride's virginity so he's already on 10 but the next thing that Evelyn says sends him over the top she tells Harry exactly what Stanny had said to her when she woke up the next morning and realized that she had been raped. That fateful morning, Stanny looked at her and said, Don't cry, kittens. Don't cry. It's all over now. Now you belong to me. End quote. Ugh. Well, just like with me, but even worse, these words would throw Harry over the wall, man. He went ballistic. He went into a fit of rage they had never seen. They had never seen this side of him. Like I said, the man he hated the most had deflowered his bride, his beautiful, sweet, innocent Evelyn. The one woman in the world he's obsessed with. He's not going to marry anybody else. He's going to marry her regardless of if she has her virginity. But it makes him so sick to his stomach. It makes him so... It's just a new passionate level of hate now that he has for Stanny. And I think it was at this point that he he vowed to ruin Stanford White, no matter what it would take. But he blows up in a fit of rage while they're on this vacation in Europe, miles and miles and miles, like on the other side of the earth, away from home. And he goes off on Evelyn. He goes off on Mrs. Nesbitt. It's the both of them's fault for letting this happen. He thinks it's their fault that she had lost her virginity to him. Like, it's Evelyn's fault for going on this dinner. It's Mrs. Nesb Nesbitt's fault for going on vacation and leaving Evelyn in the hands of Stanford. It's just their fault. And he wigs the fuck out. Now, Evelyn didn't ask for this, right? No one ever does. Hell, she just wanted to go to a nice dinner with Stanford, who had been showering her with all these gifts and expensive apartment and everything else. Like... She didn't go over there to be raped or to have sex. She went over there as a date, hoping to date this guy. It's not her fault by any means. And even if she got drunk unintentionally, even if she knew what the hell she was doing, she didn't ask to be raped. Oh, don't get me started. Anyways, this idiot makes Evelyn's mom so mad that Evelyn decides, dude, Evelyn, we're leaving. We're going home. Like, are you coming? Mom, I'm not leaving Europe. I'm going to finish my trip, okay? He's just a little mad, and I don't, I don't blame him. Bitch, I'm out of here. So, Evelyn's mom leaves. She leaves London, and she goes back home. Now, Evelyn continues on to Paris, which she never should have done, because in Paris, the trip that was all nice, fine and dandy, maybe a little hectic, maybe a little, you know, arguing here and there, all of that came to a fucking halt when they got to Austria. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I have to put a little trigger warning in here. If sexual assault or family violence, any kind of assault triggers you, you might want to skip forward just a couple of minutes. I'll try to put the timestamp in the description below that you can skip to because you'll get triggered if you watch the next two minutes of my video. So Harry's sorry for, you know, blowing up and yelling at Evelyn and blaming the whole rape on Evelyn course it's not her fault so to make it up to her he rents out an entire castle for them to stay at for a few days right I mean this castle was gorgeous and they they rented out an entire castle not just some dinky little hotel room like they this really enamored Evelyn like she was like wow this dude has some money like he don't just have money he's got money money you know so Harry decides He's going to be a fucking dick. He makes all of the servants that live and work in the, the castle to stay on one side of the castle while he and Evelyn are going to stay on the other side where they're basically blocked off from anybody hearing or seeing anything that they do. And for the next two weeks, he locks Evelyn in her room, holds her prisoner, and beats her with a whip. He beats her and beats her. He sexually assaults her over and over and over, okay? And every single time he does it, at the end of it all, he breaks down and cries, breaks down in tears, and begs her for his for her forgiveness. I mean, he apologizes over and over. He's so sorry he did this. I mean, the guy's literally had a mood swing after mood swing, losing his shit on Evelyn. And she's like, dude, what the fuck did I get myself into? I should have left with my mom. 
Dude, this poor girl has been through the ringer. And she's a teenager. She hasn't even made it to her 20s yet. So when they get back to New York, Evelyn kind of keeps her distance from Harry. But I guess on the trip, he broke her down so much because... Like, you know, I guess, like, her inner esteem, her self-esteem, he had broke down, maybe. I don't know if it's, like, a Stockholm Syndrome. I don't know what it was, but she thinks about it, and she's like, okay, I've got Stanford White over here, who I want to marry. I love the guy, but he's not going to settle down and marry me. And then I've got Harry Thaw over here who beat the fuck out of me. Now, maybe if I marry him, maybe if I marry him, he won't ever do that to me again, but I'll be financially independent. I'll be financially set and I can take care of my family and I'll never have to work in showbiz again. I'll never have to sit for another freaking artist for another 10 hours ever again. I'll be fine. Everything will be fine. My life will be a life of luxury. We'll live in mansions. We'll travel the world. We'll see plays. We'll eat lavish dinners. It'll be great. So, Evelyn marries Harry Thaw. So on April 4th, 1905, Harry marries Evelyn. They have a beautiful wedding, whatever. After the wedding, after the honeymoon, they come home and they move in with Harry's family. And that whole thing about her having this idea that he was going to get better when they got married, which he even promised her he would, but also they're going to travel the world and live lavish lifestyle and high society, high class, you know, all of this stuff never would happen because Harry got even more batshit crazy as the days went on. And Harry's mom who lived with them was even more batshit crazy than Harry himself and she would treat Evelyn like shit like trash because she came from a poor background she didn't come from high society or high class or anything she didn't even come from a family name that looked good she just came from trash in her mind and so she didn't like Evelyn and Evelyn knew this Evelyn was treated horribly the whole time and their life was not high society. It was not high class. They were not going to lavish dinners. They were not going and traveling the world and seeing beautiful plays and having this lifestyle that she thought was going to happen. And Harry's mental status began to deteriorate because the motherfucker was so dead set on ending Stanford White's career in his life because he had deflowered his wife that he got so paranoid that he thought that Stanny had hired a group of men who were from a local gang to follow Harry around and try to kill him. And he was so convinced of this that he started to carry a pistol on his person. And he would hide that pistol so nobody would know he had it, you know. Well, he took that pistol everywhere they went. They went to dinner. He had that pistol. They, he, he went to the bathroom. He had that pistol on his hip. Okay? He was that freaking paranoid. And in the meantime, he wasn't treating Evelyn any better when he had promised her he would be the best guy for her. He wasn't treating her any better. He was still beating her, still treating her like shit, still blaming her for losing her virginity. I mean, this guy was dead set on this whole thing around Evelyn's freaking vagina. Now, in June of 1906, Harry and Evelyn decide that they're going to go on another vacation in Europe. They need the vacation, right? Well, before they go, they stop in New York. And in New York, they decide to see a play at Madison Square Garden. Um, the play was called Mademoiselle Champagne. Supposedly a famous play back then. And I think it was nice for Evelyn because she would be in the crowd this time and not on stage. You know what I mean? Like, it'd be nice for her to just sit there and watch a nice play. And do something normal for a change. Because they had done shit right except get beat anyway so they go there but before they go to the play they go a block down the street to a little cafe where they decide to have dinner now while they're sitting there having dinner Harry notices somebody across the room and he his whole mood changes he gets agitated AF and who does he see none other than the famous Stanford White is sitting at a table across the restaurant with his friends dining as well and this throws Harry into a fit of rage they weren't expecting to see him while they were there but I guess Harry was hoping a little bit because what happens next is crazy bullshit now remember I told you he started carrying that damn pistol around with him everywhere he went and this was no exception okay he had that pistol hidden under his coat and even though this was a hot June night Harry refused to take off his overcoat that he was wearing over his tuxedo. Evelyn thought this was weird, but she was like, whatever, dude, it's Harry. He's fucking mental. Whatever. 
So she goes along with it. They go into the play. They, they watch the play. During the play, though, I think Harry was seething. I think the whole time he was thinking, what can I do? Should I beat him up? Should I talk to him? What should I do? No one knows what the hell Harry was thinking, but the play ended around 11 o'clock, and during the finale, Harry was seen walking up to the famous Stanford White table, which is where Stanny and his friends would always sit. Like, they always sat here. And Harry is seen walking up to the table several times, but, like, retreating. So, like, he would walk up to the table to talk to Stan and retreat. Like, he couldn't get up the courage to go do whatever he wanted to do to confront him or whatever. And it seemed like... Stanny was oblivious to the whole thing like he had no idea that the whole time he's watching the finale there's this crazy motherfucker over here stalking him however Harry does eventually get the courage to go up to Stanford and confront him and boy does he the crazy mofo walks up to Stanford White and Stanford is not faced by this like he doesn't give a shit okay he's not threatened by the dude by any means Harry points the gun at Stanford and shoots him in the head point blank twice and once in the back as if the two bullets to the head was not enough to kill the man I mean the guy was unrecognizable his whole face his skull was blown off like it was disgusting and he had done this in front of a whole rooftop full of people they were on the roof of the Madison Square Garden building okay like he had done this in front of like a hundred people didn't give a shit stood over his body like in triumph in victory or some shit and he looks up at the crowd and he says quote I did it because he ruined my wife he had it coming to him he took advantage of the girl and then abandoned her you'll never go out with that woman again end quote right over Stanford White's dead lifeless body no one could believe what he had done I mean, nobody. He was immediately arrested, of course, and Evelyn was able to flee the hectic, freaking out crowd and was able to get to a nearby friend's apartment and she literally stayed there and laid low for a few days and was in a state of shock. Like, she said that she felt like this lifelessness just entered her mind and her body and she was walking around like a zombie. Like, she just, she was in shock. She could not believe that that had happened. You know, she knew Harry was crazy AF, but she didn't know that he was crazy enough to do that. She didn't know that when Harry bought that gun what he intended to do with it I mean if she had known she would have tried to stop it right we all hope anyway Harry was charged with first-degree murder and held without bond now <laughs> this is a picture of the jail cell and Harry sitting in his jail cell eating a fine dinner on a beautiful dining table with beautiful dining china and a catered meal right next to him is not the three inch standard piece of shit pad that prisoners usually have to sleep on no it's a brass bed with an expensive mattress and he's not wearing you know the beautiful prison inmate outfit that most inmates have to wear no he's wearing his personal tailored to him suits I mean he was given preferential treatment like literally the doctor prescribed him a certain allotment of wine and champagne every day who gets that you know but trial would ensue not too long after but before the trial began the whole media dude media blew up this case was known throughout the entire country throughout the entire world all of the headlines the next morning read things like her virginity led to a evil murder beautiful woman leads to murder like everyone was painting a picture of Harry Thaw as this like heroic guy who avenged his wife who had been raped and assaulted and he was just avenging her that's why he killed the man and the man had had to be stopped because he had done this to other women so he was the hero and and Stanford White and Evelyn Nesbitt were just painted as the villains even Evelyn for some reason was painted as, a, as the villain even though she had nothing to do with the fact that she was raped I mean the press literally took up for Harry so much and then even the district attorney who was on the case they hired a firm to do a smear campaign on Stanford White and Elizabeth Nesbitt because they wanted them to look bad and they wanted Harry to look good for some reason and I think it was because of Harry's money because it is pr a proven fact that Harry's mom would step in like she always had to save his ass and show the world that she was going to take up for him and do whatever it took to keep him out of jail because she hired several doctors and psychiatrists and lawyers and out the whole nine yards she spent 1.5 million dollars 
on these professionals to go in there and testify on her son's behalf to say that he was temporarily insane because the defense wanted to say that he was insane like he was not guilty by insanity of course, right like I know they all plead that right but I think he really is insane honestly but she didn't want that kind of like bad reputation on her son because it came with that connotation as like if you're insane like you're poor or you don't have a good background or a good family name that was that kind of like stigma back then and so she didn't want that in her family, right? She didn't want people thinking that about her family, so she wanted them to plead temporary insanity. And, they, and she wanted these doctors and lawyers to say that he was temporarily insane. That way, he could get, just get a little bit of time in an insane asylum instead of having to spend the rest of his life in prison. Or much worse, what they were trying to get off the table was the death penalty. They did not want him to be sitting on death row. And that's the main reason why they did the whole insanity plea. This is what was so weird about the jury is this was the first sequestered jury in the history of the world, basically, or at least America, because they said that the press was so widespread, like the newspapers, the radio, everything, like this case was everywhere. And they were all like painting him as a hero. And the court did not want for the jury to get tainted by these this evidence that wasn't admissible in court or these biased opinions so they sequestered them meaning they put them in a hotel room they weren't allowed to like read the newspaper listen to the radio speak to anyone in the outside world nothing nothing they had to stay in that hotel room until the trial was over so they deliberated for 47 hours over the man's guilt and they came back deadlocked which deadlocked means that they did not have a unanimous vote on if he was guilty or not and the thing was they had to declare a mistrial because seven of them said that he was guilty and five said that he was not guilty so the thing with that is is he was being charged with first degree murder in first degree murder in america you have to prove that it was premeditated that they had decided to do this do this a long time before they ever committed the crime of murder and in order to prove that you have to have a lot of evidence and back then in the early 1900s evidence was shit so they didn't have the, enough evidence for the entire jury to say that without a shadow of a doubt he definitely planned to do this and murdered the guy after he planned on murdering him i think that's where the problem was i think if they had charged him with second degree murder which is just like hey dude i lost my shit went up to him and shot him that there's no premeditation involved i think they would have got a conviction the first time however they didn't and it was a mistrial now they go into the second trial and he the second jury decides to say that he's not guilty because of temporary insanity however he is sentenced to life in an insane asylum and this pissed off harry so much because he really thought that like no sane person in their right mind would convict a man who had done such a chivalrous act as to go and avenge his wife's virginity like he could not believe that people would convict him of this but seven people already had and now they had sent him to live in a mental institution for the rest of his life which he would go on to fight like hell so y'all he's living in this mental institution and he tries his best to go about it the legal way and be proven to be sane and he can't get the doctors to say that he's sane and he can't get the judge to release him and he can't get his lawyers to get the judge to release him and i mean he tries everything that he can finally one day he just walks the fuck up out of there just walks out of there and gets in the car and drives over the canadian border and stays in canada as long as he can and fights the extradition back to America, back to New York, as long as he can. And he finally gets his day in court, goes back to America, gets his day in court, and they find that he is now sane, and they let him walk free. Ta-da! You're out, buddy. Go away. Go live your life. Like, I can't with this guy. This guy has gotten away with so much stuff over his lifetime. I'm like, I, if I got into everything that he had gotten away with, y'all, we would be sitting here for fucking hours. This is not the only thing, but I digress. But even though he got out in 1916, he would be arrested once again for the kidnapping, assault, and rape of a 19-year-old man named Frederick Gump. Temporary insanity? Really? Temporary? Temporary? The man's balls to the wall is crazy. That's all there is to it. He's lost his marbles. Now, he was tried and convicted, and they found him to actually be insane. Not temporarily insane, but actually insane. And he was sent to another mental institution. And he stayed there until 1924, 
when he kind of got like a probationary hearing where they found him sane again and they let him walk free for the rest of his life. Now he would go on to die in 1947 and I think his tombstone literally reads something like he's like innocent of all of this and whatever which is crazy to put on your tombstone but his mother was crazy remember so she didn't want anybody to know how insane he was. In 1910 a Elizabeth, I swear to God, if I say her name one more time. Evelyn would give birth to a son who she swore was Harry Thal's son. She said that she had conceived him during a conjugal visit when he was in prison or in the insane asylum. Harry would go on to deny this baby. And so the baby was never put into Harry's will. You know, like I said, he was due to inherit that $40 million, which he did go on to inherit. Evelyn's little boy never got a penny of that. However, see, Evelyn did testify on Harry's behalf during the two trials. And it was said that the Thal family had paid her between $25,000 and a hundred thousand dollars to do so and like if he got a good outcome then they would pay her but if the outcome was terrible like if he was found guilty and sent to death row or to jail she wouldn't get it so it was like riding on her shoulders to get the jury to believe that he was this good guy who just temporarily freaked out on a man anyway i think evelyn has said that no she didn't get the money but i know for a fact that she was cut off after that because they divorced after the trial and she was basically cut off from the family. The family didn't speak to her, period. But later on, Evelyn's grandson did say that he thought, it was his understanding throughout the family word that she had received $25,000, which would be about $100,000 today, for testifying. Later on, Evelyn would get into some trouble herself and Harry would come to her aid and people were thinking they were getting back together, which they didn't. But um, apparently um, they had reconciled in the very end. They didn't get back together, but before Harry died, he did leave $10,000 of his $1 million estate to Evelyn then passed away in 1947. That was natural causes. It was from a heart attack while he was in Florida. Evelyn did go on to remarry. Um, the marriage did not work out, but they divorced. And from then on out, for the rest of her life, she took care of her son and her family. Her son even appeared in a few mo movies and Broadway plays with Evelyn. So she worked, you know, on Broadway and in plays and musicals and all these things for the rest of her life, basically, and took care of her family, did what she had to do. And she died in a nursing home in 1967 at the ripe old age of 82. So what do you guys think of this story? I mean, I know it was a long one, and thank you for hanging in there with me, but like this story is crazy and i think it was definitely the crime of the century yeah crazy uh let me know what you guys think in the comments below i would love to hear your opinion on harry's mental status and what you think about evelyn and her choice of men but anyway guys make sure you hit that subscribe button share this video with a friend or two let's get our subscribers up we need to grow the family guys come on anyways check me out on the socials as well and i will see you guys next week for another mystery monday bye